Hello everybody, I'm Rick Chambers, and during this Professorate.com Greatest Museum segment, we're going to take a detailed look at the Vatican Museums in Rome. Snaking along miles of palace corridors or joining St. Peter's Basilica, this kind of feels less like a museum than a treasure hoard of 2,000-year-old empire. And in many respects, that's exactly what this is. But it is even more than that, really, when you think about it, for the Vatican Museums not only contain great works of art, much of the complex itself is also a great work of art. Here is a place to see masterworks created as decoration, and not only the Sistine Chapel we're talking about here, arguably the greatest single work of visual art in the world. But that's part of the problem here, because to see the Sistine Chapel, you're going to have to walk for hours in lines that will probably remind you of the check-in stand at JFK on a snowbound Thanksgiving flight, except that you're probably here on a very muggy summer's day. Of all the great museums on this particular list, probably none is more exhausting to visit than this particular one. Still though, along the way, there are many extraordinary things that you're gonna see. The museum itself is 400 years older than the country in which it sits, Vatican City, which is the world's smallest independent state. In fact, as an institution, this complex dates back to the discovery of a remarkable statue from ancient Greece, the Lookoa depicting a Trojan priest struggling with a sea serpent. This masterpiece was discovered buried among Roman ruins in 1506 and then shown immediately to Michelangelo, whose muscular twisting forms were said to be much influenced by its dramatic form. Before the Mona Lisa became the world's most famous artwork, the local one long held that title. In fact, the British artist William Blake made a famous print version of it, and Charles Dickens, in A Christmas Carol, even compared Ebenezer Scrooge to the tormented Trojan. Not far from the Lokoan is another late Greek work in marble. It's a statue of the sun god Apollo, known in the art world as the Apollo Belvedere, which in the 18th and 19th centuries was held by many, really, to be the epitome of male physical perfection. To many today, this Apollo seems a bit fussy and self-obsessed, but those may have been the qualities that were favored at the era of Napoleon. Apart from sculptures, the Vatican Museum contains a bewildering array of art displayed in several distinct separate museums, but all part of one giant museum complex. Paintings on canvas, for example, are found in what's called the Pinocoteca, or the picture gallery. Here you're going to find works by Leonardo, Giotto, Raphael, Tishan, and Caravaggio. But paintings on canvas are hardly the main attraction at the Vatican because more than anything else, really, this place is famous for its paintings on the wet stucco, a form known as fresco. These frescoes were painted as decoration for the dwellings and private chapels for the popes who lived here at the Vatican. Today, many of these are open to the public as part of the Vatican museums. To view these unique sites, the visitor enters a, a gigantic compound, which is still home to the pope today, in fact. It's called the Apostolic Palace. Within this palace complex are found several extraordinary areas that are open to the public. One of these is for many the greatest single surprise at the Vatican Museum. This is called the Gallery of Maps. This is a, a long, long corridor decorated with frescoes of maps painted between 1580 and 1585. These represent the, the papal properties at the time of Pope Gregory XIII from 1572 to 1585. Other extraordinary highlights include the private apartments and the chapels of the popes who lived here throughout history. The Borgia apartment, for example. That was adapted for personal use by Pope Alexander VI, the Rodigio de Borgia. In the late 15th century, Pope Alexander commissioned the Italian painter Bernardino de Beto, or Pinturicchio, and his studio to decorate them with frescoes. Pinturicchio may not be a household name today, but visitors are still just astonished by his brilliant use of color. More extraordinary frescoes can be found in the Nicoline Chapel, the Italian Cappello Nicolina. It's a chapel in the Vatican Palace. The most famous here are by Fra Angelico from 1447 to 1451 and his assistants. The walls of this chapel were decorated with images of two of the earliest Christian martyrs, St. Stephen and St. Lawrence. The painting is notable for its use of soft color and lifelike modeling. Fra Angelico achieves, I think, a sense of balance and harmony which puts this work high in the pantheon of Renaissance art. Perhaps the most famous frescoes with the Apostolic Palace are those by the Renaissance artist Raphael and his students. 
These are found in the so-called Raphael rooms, which are really apartments of the Pope Julius II from 1503 to 1513. Of these frescoes, the School of Athens is the most celebrated. This is Raphael's tribute to the world of ancient Greece, which had inspired the intellectual awakening of all of Europe. In this painting, the great figures of Greece like Plato, Aristotle, Euclid, and others are depicted by figures actually resembling the great men of Raphael's own time, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Bramante, and, and others as well. Raphael seems to be making the point that the light of reason lit by ancient Greece has been reignited by the intellectual fervor of the Italian Renaissance. Finally, of course, there is the Sistine Chapel itself, with Michelangelo's justly famous ceiling and the much later Last Judgment. Many would rank the achievement here alongside Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, say, or Shakespeare's Hamlet, and a very few other works. This is one of mankind's greatest triumphs. Of course, everyone in the world wants to see this particular room, so you're not going to be alone here, though the rumor has it that you can be in the evening for a special price. But for mere mortals, here's a tip for you. The museum tends to be less crowded in the afternoon after the hordes of tour buses have returned to their stables. Try to time your visit so that you see the chapel just before closing time. You, of course, are going to be herded through no matter what time you visit here, so this technique won't shorten your actual viewing time in the chapel itself. In fact, it may very well give you maybe a few extra minutes, and then those minutes might very well be less blighted by all the overcrowding. There is a technique in this, of course, and if you're good, you might even find yourself the last visitors of the day and for a few very precious moments communing with Michelangelo alone. Remember though, it is impossible to visit the chapel in just a short, short visit. The museum design requires that you walk a great distance through various planned itineraries, and even the shortest of these involve maybe 60 to 90 minutes of marching around before you actually get to the Sistine Chapel. And you're going to need time to purchase your tickets as well. The Vatican Museums are open Monday to Saturday. The ticket office is open from 9 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. The museum closes at 6 in the evening. It's also closed on Sunday, except the last Sunday of every month, and free entrance is from 9 in the morning until 12.30. The museums close at 2 in the afternoon, unless it coincides with Easter Sunday, which is the 29th of June. Now keep in mind, admission tickets to the Vatican Museums, including the Sistine Chapel. The admission ticket permits the tourists to visit the Vatican Museums and the Sistine Chapel and is valid the day of issue. Tickets are not refundable, keep that in mind, and some of the sections of the Vatican Museum, usually closed to the public, can be visited on request, so you may want to do that as well. Apart from the Vatican Museums, there are at least two other museums that you've got to visit while you're in Rome. First is the Capitoline Museum, which is famous as the oldest museum complex in the entire world. Designed but not constructed by Michelangelo, it occupies the summit, or the Capitoline Hill. This is the former site of the Temple of Jupiter in ancient Rome, and it's the seat of the Roman government for millennia. In fact, one of the buildings here remains the office of the mayor of Rome even to this day. Behind its Renaissance facade, one can still see a medieval palace there built over ancient Roman columns. And the view from this palace overlooking the heart of the Roman Forum is one of the most romantic sights, I think, in all the world. The art here focuses on the local, which in this case means ancient Rome. Here, you're going to find the legendary equestrian statue of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, famous these days, I think, from the film Gladiator, remember that? And the Capitoline Venus, an astonishing, empathetic sculpture of a dying Gaul, and the portrait sculptures of illustrious Romans and Greeks as well. All right, now let's talk about the Galleria Borghese. This is a small museum housed in the former Renaissance pleasure palace of a noble family. Surrounded by the lush greenery of the Via Borghese Park, it was later the possession of the Emperor Napoleon, who transported some of its treasures, of course, back to France, where they can now be admired in the Louvre. What remains here, however, is choice. The statues by Bernini, they are some of the most spectacular in the world, and the small collection of paintings by Raphael, Caravaggio, Correggio, Bellini, Tishan, Andrea del Sarto, and others as well, pound for pound, I think, as strong as any other in the world. No matter how brief your stay in Rome may be, find time to visit this one. This is, without a doubt, one of the crown jewels. And we also have a lot of practical information before your visit to the Vatican Museums. And again, we want to thank you for watching The Vatican Museums by Professorate.com. I'm Rick Chambers. Be sure to watch all of the other great museum videos as well. We'll see you next time.